the 1960s were incredibly optimistic. It was absolutely an era of real miracles. These films, problems must be solved every day. It was the dawn of a new era. The technological progress was unstoppable. A fantastic belief in the possibilities of the future. Back then it was the future, and today it's the past. It all began in 1957 with Sputnik and its peeping signals that had the whole world abuzz. It appeared the Soviets had won the race into space. hearing the actual signals transmitted by the Earth-circling satellite, one of the great scientific feats of the age. On October 4th, 1957, Russia launched Sputnik 1 into Earth's orbit. It was the world's first man-made satellite. Its signals rang in a new era, the space age, and with it the 1960s, a decade that, like no other, grew intoxicated with an optimistic futurism. The Soviet Union now appeared strides ahead of the United States in space exploration. A huge shock for the Americans. Sputnik 1 was the opening salvo in the space race. The Cold War provided the political backdrop. Naturally, the media was following the arms race. So the Cold War was practically expanded into space, where crazy battles would play out. The race into space was above all a race for technological superiority. Rocket programs developed during the Second World War were now poised to conquer space. When the Soviets got there first, the U.S. came under intense pressure to catch up. Even before the test phase was completed, the U.S. rolled out its Vanguard rocket program. However, there were only a few dedicated men who believed in space. In desperation, the United States looked to the Vanguard. Nearly 200 newsmen from all over the world were flown down for the big turkey shoot. At the launching site, they were given a play-by-play -play account. They witnessed each tiny detail of the usually top-secret preparation. America's prestige had never been lower than at this moment, 11.45 a.m., December 6, 1957. Matthias Horx has built a career on scouting out trends and identifying future opportunities. He lives with his family on the outskirts of Vienna in what he calls a future evolution house, built on the basis of his findings as a futurist. Horks is one of the most influential trend researchers in the German-speaking world. I'm a child of the 1960s, and as a boy who was a bit of a loner with a little imagination, you automatically came across these utopian visions. It was a very future-oriented era with fast-paced progress on a lot of fronts, and that influenced me profoundly. Rocket launches became media spectacles. The future had begun. 
The future was this bright, enlightened, technologically advanced wonderland where every problem would be solved, and in particular all emotional problems would be eradicated through technology. That was the big promise. And if you look back at that time today, not much has really changed. Technology today is still viewed as liberating, or conversely as apocalyptic. In the 1960s, nothing raised the specter of an apocalypse like the destructive force of the atomic bomb. The U.S. had successfully conducted the world's first above-ground nuclear weapons test on July 16, 1945. Three weeks later, it dropped the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. Nuclear power unleashed hell on Earth, but at the same time, it held out the promise of a clean and unlimited power supply. It felt like for the second time in history, the human race had discovered fire. Only this time, it was inextinguishable. Nuclear power got a nod from architecture at the 1958 World's Fair in Brussels with the construction of the city's landmark Atomium. The fair's motto was technology in the service of humanity, human progress through technical progress. So welcome, enjoy the view, look up. This elevator was in 1958 in Europe, the fastest one. We go to an altitude of 92 meters in 22 seconds. I've always been interested in the future. The question of where next has always been the driving force behind everything I do. The past, on the other hand, never interested me much. I had to put up with history in school, but I was always much more interested in what is still to come. So I was always getting out library books with a spaceship or planet on the cover. The title or author were of no importance. What mattered was what the book looked like. I was only interested if the story took place either somewhere else or in the future. Naturally, the future also plays a key role in the books by best-selling German science fiction writer Andreas Eschbach. In the 60s, before the student riots, people were very technologically oriented. A technological solution was always tantamount to a good solution. Everything else was half-baked or just not as good. You needed a machine to solve a problem, or even better, a pill. The TV show Mr. Terrific comes to mind. He had two small pills and one big one. The two small pills lent him superpowers for 10 minutes, the big one for an hour. The notion of substituting pills for food was, of course, part of the enormous industrialization of humankind itself, the process of reducing people to their functions. You don't have to worry about diets if you take these pills. They rearrange the calories. The general feeling was that this was the way that we were headed. We'll just be eating pills and be served by robots. All things that today we'd consider a terrible future. But back then people thought it was great. The West was on its way into the future. New technologies were introduced into the labor market, giving rise to new careers. Automation, computer technology, and cybernetics spurred a second industrial revolution.
Watson and Crick were credited with discovering this structure of DNA. Robots went to work. The conventional old human brain looks set to be replaced by the more powerful electronic brain. Imagine, if you can, an electronic brain operating at millionth of a second speed. I say brain because the new electronic central office will almost think for itself. The age of innocence, when it came to the progress of the 1960s, was naturally a wonderful time. You really could say that it generated feelings on a par with a religious awakening. The redemptive power of technology also filtered down into everyday life. The housewife of tomorrow would no longer have to lift a finger, except to switch on gadgets in the intelligent kitchen of the future. I remember a new technological innovation on the table every birthday and every Christmas. There was the famous electrically powered Carrera slot car racing track and all kinds of technological marvels that you'd seen on TV. Get your ideal Astro Base today. Okay, Robert can go forward, backward, or in any direction. Shoulder to shoulder, Robert marches to the next station, where his steering controls are locked into place. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six. We were boys who were infinitely bored with the world, growing up within social structures that were still very rigid, with a lot of rules and regulations, with authoritarian fathers and parents. That fueled a strong appetite for fantasy. Because most technologies were still in their infancy, it was largely literature that satiated the desire for freedom and fantastic adventure. There were novels set in the future and comic books in which fantasy knew no bounds when it came to visions of the future. I've been reading comics for as long as I can remember. It became my passion. Mickey Mouse was the first comic book series I read. I remember exactly when my war generation father brought home a stack of Mickey Mouse comic books he found, and those were my first comics. In Germany, there was the series Nick the Space Traveler that appeared early in 1958, so shortly after the Sputnik launch. At the time, the illustrator Hans-Rudi Wäscher went to his publisher Walter Lening, who said, we absolutely have to do something about Sputnik with space. And so Wäscher gave it some thought and was thinking, Sputnik, Sputnik, Nick the Space Traveler. Nick, Nick the Weltraumfahrer. And that was the birth of the first German science fiction comic series. Deutsche science fiction comic. In the 1960s, France was swept up in the comic book boom. With their series, Valerian and Laura Lean, Jean-Claude Mézières and Pierre Christin remain a fixture of French pop culture to this day. French and Franco-Belgian comics are in a league of their own. In Germany, for example, comics as a literary genre are somewhat marginalized. 
à l'écart. Euh, In France, you can find our comics on the shelf next to works by Pierre Bourdieu or philosophers. Des œuvres de Pierre Bourdieu ou des philosophes. The two have been collaborating on their science fiction series since 1967. At the time, Christin and Mazier were pioneering a new art form with their space-time agents Valerian and Laureline. When we started Valerian and Laureline, we had just returned from living in the U.S. It was the era of the superheroes. When we came back to France, there were hardly any science fiction comics. We thought it was the ideal opportunity to create something French, European and at the same time do something diametrically opposed to what was common in the United States. The stories there were typically centered on superheroes and the battle between good and evil. I decided against making Valerian a hero. He doesn't have any special powers. He is courageous, he is honest and intelligent, but he doesn't have any special characteristics. But something was still missing, something that was virtually non-existent in American as well as French comics at the time, namely a heroine. Because women were in the process of making huge advances through the feminist movement in America as well as in France where it was gaining ground. We were also trying to counter a specific trend in American literature that had long dominated the genres of the science fiction novel and the comic book. Here, aliens had taken the place of Indians in the Wild West. A good Indian was a dead Indian, and likewise, a good alien was a dead alien. I can't think of a single instance in which humanity learned something valuable from the aliens. Humankind always occupied pride of place in the pantheon of species. But the first living beings to be catapulted into space were neither astronauts nor cosmonauts. They were four-legged pioneers. The first to make it into orbit was the Soviet dog Laika, who took off just a few weeks after Sputnik. It was a one-way ticket with technology not yet advanced as far as the return trip. Still, the Soviet Union again proved it was ahead in the space race. The second Sputnik was not only a tremendous scientific achievement in itself, but in the information received on Laika's long flight into space, the Soviets gained a priceless advantage in any forthcoming race to put a man in space. TV was the first major window on the world. It brought us the diversity and the marvels of the world into our homes. And that's where we saw them for the first time. See all color shows in living color. These were synchronized and interactive experiences. The event resonated with the viewer, fueling fantasies in many thousands and millions of brains. Fantasies about the future. How would we live? Where would we live? Would we leave Earth, colonize the ocean floor, or even space? You can detect the Sputnik shock in architecture. It manifests itself in an unbelievable dynamism. It generated many designs with a utopian slant, which flirted with hedonism and the removal of constraints and so forth. But the ideas of the 1960s in many cases were never realized. So it was a good time for visions, but very few actually materialized.
If, for example, you look at the work of Archigram, a group of architects in Britain, they actually tapped into an entirely different medium. They didn't just turn their architecture designs into drawings and models that circulated in a professional arena, they also drew comics. Archigram's publications were originally a series of pamphlets. You could also call them a type of fanzine. And they made use of the language of comics, of space, and superhero antics. The Swiss artist Walter Jonas was another pioneer in the realm of architecture. Not a builder, but rather a man with vision and ideas. Ideas are a peculiar thing. You don't know how to get them. Walter Jonas is an interesting figure. He was viewed as something of an anomaly, because he never built anything. He was by training an artist, but he was committed to a particular type of urban development, the funnel-shaped housing unit, a concept he pursued in earnest. In Africa, we find buildings roughly of this shape and seat again in our own modern-day rooftops. We also find it in the giant pyramids, the edifices that mark burial sites. But this solution is an inversion. The house opens up towards the sky, hardly touching the ground. The sky becomes the landscape, the landscape that is the big adventure of modern-day mankind. Such a funnel building was a big complex designed to house some 3,000 people. It has a very small footprint. Today we also talk about an ecological footprint. Back then the footprint played a major role in urban planning. It's morning, the sun rises. It's midday. All of the funnels are brightly illuminated. We can clearly see the bridges that connect and stabilize the individual funnels. Pedestrian traffic can proceed safely high above ground level. Obviously, the concept incorporates ideals of communal living. The new community center is a green heart, a pond, a park. The same is true of the funnel building and residents live around it. It does beg the question of how long we would have lasted in there. This type of forced happiness through communal living is hard to imagine actually working. From the ground, the intracity presents this picture. With one massive amounts of space for automobile traffic in densely populated areas, the city is also very transparent from all sides. Contrary to the unrealized utopias advanced by architecture, space exploration continued to make strides. In 1961, Yuri Gagarin became the first man in space. Four years later, cosmonaut Alexei Leonov stepped out for the first spacewalk. It was an exciting time for dreamers and visionaries like the German artist Charles Wilp. He was also a photographer, musician, and a composer, and was a pioneer in the world of advertising. His creative output was shaped by the age of space exploration. This is the frozen bang. A tank from a satellite cluster that naturally exploded when it fell to Earth. Charles turned it into the frozen bang in memory of Eve Klein and they worked together. A sculpture that's alive. The foil expands in warm temperatures and now it's a bit chillier, then it contracts again. 
Charles Wilk was a tremendously versatile person. Everyone thought they knew him, and no one knew him. He was an artist, photographer, advertising designer, musician, composer. And as the jewel in the crown of his career, he became an astronaut and worked on board spacecraft in zero gravity. Charles Wilp never made it into space, but he did work on art in zero gravity on numerous simulation flights. His big vision was a module docked to a space station that would serve as an art academy in space where anyone was welcome, in the spirit of Josef Beuys, who believed everyone is an artist, lawyers, scientists, politicians, everyone. But the idea called for an empty module, a place to simply encounter zero gravity as the greatest art of all. Charles Wilp set new standards in European advertising with his legendary Africola campaign. Sexy, mini, super, flower, pop of cola, Africola. The Africola campaign was a milestone in his career. The Africola lust. Die Erde ist ein Paradies mit Afrikola. Lustvolle Gefilde Afrikola hungriger Gefühle. Die Frau wird Frau und frei. Girl Power, Frauenlip und Männerfreiheit. Er war in Huntsville, Alabama. He was in Huntsville, Alabama and visited Werner von Braun, who gave him a tour and showed him the Saturn V rocket that was still in a cold tent. And through the misty, iced-up plastic sheeting, he spotted one of the workers' locker doors opening and closing. And naturally, there was a pin-up inside. That was the image that gave birth to the Africola ad. Sexy, mini, super, flower, pop-up cola, alles ist in Africola. He offered it first to American companies, but Coca-Cola, as he put it, was too prudish. Sexy Cola Mood Elixir, Super Cola Alcohol-Free Party Drink, Flower Cola Refreshing Even in Bad Weather, Pop-Up Cola, The Old Recipe and the New Design, Sexy Mini Super Flower Pop-Up Cola, Everything's in Africola. People who enjoy their free time fully conscious, awake and on the move with Africola. It remains to be seen whether you too will one day feel at home in this future made of plastic and chrome. To us it looks a bit impersonal, cool luxury furnished with ingenious appliances. After rising to challenging roles in World War II, women were relegated back to the role of the perfect housewife, but they were bombarded with technology. The housewife's busy day will entail keeping a watchful eye on the robots, the silent and reliable servants of the year 2000. Again, there was this promise of redemption, but of course women were being immobilized. They were harmless, and they didn't even figure in space. So space exploration and utopian science were also a way of disposing of women, of keeping them at bay. One last nightcap and then into the self-regulating heated bed. Tomorrow's dreams of the future. Naturally, they later surfaced as sex symbols in space, but as a total misrepresentation, an exaggeration that had nothing to do with real women. Above all, it was women with atomic breasts who had a stellar career in the world of space fantasy, like Barbarella, that scantily clad space heroine created by French illustrator Jean-Claude Forrest. Since her inception in 1962, Barbarella has fueled the fantasies of boys and men. 
man kann fast sagen, es ist der erste europäische Comic. It was the first äh, European comic series aimed directly äh, at an adult also readership. Comics, äh, waren ja Until then, so comics had been considered äh, fodder for illiterates, für entertainment Alter fast food also, for adolescents. Äh, Unterhaltungsfast food für, für Pubertierende. If you had an education, you didn't read comics. Last kind of comics. Barbarella is a space heroine who jets from one planet to another. But at the end of the day, all that really matters is that she undresses as quickly as possible. It was an age when you weren't instantly landing on some pornographic website with every mouse click. It was all much more mysterious and hidden. That was naturally sensational. The first installments were published in an erotic magazine that didn't adhere to any standards of etiquette. So, illustrators publishing there had a green light to do whatever they wanted, regardless of conventions. Barbarella appeared in a small magazine, and I stumbled across a few pages. I considered the illustrations by Jean-Claude Forest extremely innovative, naturally also because of the female protagonist. He created the first modern and important comic book heroine. When the comic appeared, it caused a stir in France. Censors were up in arms and the question was raised, can comics do that? So the movie starring Jane Fonda served as confirmation. Naturally, comics can do that. Bestätigung, natürlich kann kann der Comic das machen. Meet the most beautiful creature of the future. Her name is Barbarella, and she makes science fiction something else. Jane Fonda is Barbarella. <laughs> Barbarella is a five-star, double-rated astro-navigatrix Earth girl whose specialty is... Love. Good many dramatic situations begin with screaming. See Barbarella do her thing with the nice angel. Da, da, da. With the warm, friendly ice man. With the cold, evil black queen. Hello, pretty, pretty. Man kann natürlich sagen, ist auch oft getan worden. It's also often been said that comic series like Jodel or Barbarella are sexist because they present women the way men like to see them and because they were, for the most part, created by men. But there's another side to the coin. Women didn't feature in comics up until that point, and now suddenly they were taking center stage. So that is also an aspect of the cultural watershed that occurred in 1968 and the ensuing years. This spirit of transformation also impacted Valerian and Laura Lean. The series was defined by Jean-Claude Mézières' unusual illustration style and the self-confidence of the characters created by Pierre Crestin. I'm a reckless illustrator. People need to figure out themselves what to make of it. I draw with my head slightly bowed. I draw things that are larger, smaller, or stand like this or that. I enjoy that. What's important to me is that my readers believe this reality. I don't know how the rest works.
Valerian and Laureline was both an experiment for us and a lesson. Science fiction comics were totally new at the time. Readers were open to our work, and they welcomed the appearance of a female lead. They considered her classy. Psychologically, Valerian is weaker. He sometimes drinks too much and goes on sexual escapades that are a bit tasteless. Laureline, on the other hand, is more subtle. Her tremendous self-confidence is never shaken. She's fearless. Valérian, well, he has his weaknesses. The mood in the 1960s was totally different to that of the present day. The 60s were optimistic years. Conquering space was the major issue in the Soviet Union as well as in the United States. La grande affaire, c'était People thought that physically occupying the moon was the ticket to world domination, but it felt like a peaceful competition, like the Olympics or a soccer match. It was miraculous. One side closed in on the other, and by doing that, each side challenged the other. The obvious finish line of the race into space was the moon. Reaching Earth's natural satellite was viewed as the first milestone on humankind's journey into space, and the countdown was on. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, by command. We live in an age of unprecedented technological achievements, scientific adventures, whose full benefits to mankind cannot as yet be fully foreseen. Yet man's greatest adventure may be more than a monumental landing on the moon. July 16th, the day had come. The moon awaited. The men rose early, ate breakfast, and dressed in their spacesuits. Astronaut Edwin Aldrin, Jr. would pilot the lunar module, and astronaut Neil Armstrong would serve as mission commander. Armstrong would be the first man to step upon the moon. I stayed up to watch the moon landing. 12, 11, 10, 9, ignition sequence start. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, all engine running. Of course, when they landed on the moon, it was nighttime in Europe, so the teacher gave us the next morning off. I was 11 at the time, and I was sitting in front of the TV in my pajamas, totally bored by it all. It looked something like an ultrasound image of an unborn child. It was blurry. I knew from sci-fi comics that monsters wouldn't just appear. It's really hair-raising the way they steered that thing. They had to enter machine codes with specific coordinates to run through their various routines. They had software on board that today would be considered too primitive to install inside a washing machine. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. 
The expectation was that this was the first step. The next would be to fly to Mars, and then build space stations, and cities on the moon, and so on. To me, it felt like a done deal. <laughs> There's this wonderful scene where Aldrin and his team are orbiting the moon and suddenly it occurs to them to switch the camera angle. They've been photographing the craters down below, but then they focus the lens on the Earth and there's this moment of epiphany. Ultimately, that triggered a mental phenomenon of expanded consciousness. We copy you down, Eagle. So, in that respect, the moon landing was a spiritual success because it opened our eyes to the possibility of correlations. Apollo 11's mission was a triumph of human engineering. Half a billion people tuned in to watch the live broadcast of Armstrong and Aldrin's first steps on the moon. The lunar landing was the first truly global media event. But the 1960s optimistic belief in the blessings of technological progress went unfulfilled. I think people back then would be surprised by how many things we don't have. The monorail is still not the common mode of transportation. Much is the same today as it was back then. No one expected that. The great thing about the technologies of the 1960s was that they were outward oriented. The spacecraft that flew into outer space, that doesn't actually affect us, we remain the same. Today we have technologies that intrinsically change the human experience, and that is often unsettling, because we can see how this constant interconnectivity is impacting our lives, and that it also feeds negative forces. Technology has lost its innocence, that's the big difference. Today we're living in an almost futureless era, or, and this is something a futurist knows, it is up to us to reinvent the future.